So I'd like to introduce our speaker here for this session. Um, this is Dr. Linda McLoon. Uh, Dr. McLoon is currently a tenured professor at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Neuroscience at the University of Minnesota, right here in our own backyard here. Minnesota. Um, in oh, Minnesota. Oh. <laughs> she received a BS from the University of New York at Binghamton and a PhD in anatomy from the University of Illinois at the Chicago, uh, sorry, the Medical Center in Chicago. Uh, she currently studies potential mechanisms and treatment of diseases of the extraocular eye muscles with a focus on pharmacological approaches to the treatment of ocular motor disorders. She is the author of over 90 uh, public, peer reviewed publications and 20 book chapters. That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> and let's see. Um, uh, her research has a long history of uh, National Institutes of Health funding, as well as support from numerous private research uh, foundations. Uh, in her laboratory, she has mentored over 50 undergraduate students, 50 medical, uh, 60 medical students, and numerous uh, graduate students and fellows, and that's a lot as well. So please welcome Dr. McClure. Thank you. So I, I understand that this mic is not for volume, so if you don't, can't hear me, just wave, okay, because sometimes I wander down in volume. So you guys are brave to come to a basic science talk, um, and so I'm, go I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about eye movements and what we do and don't understand from a really global basic science point of view, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we do in my lab and how we think about, about nystagmus, because I think Part of the problem is for certainly what we're going to call idiopathic nystagmus, infantile nystagmus syndrome, for which we really don't know the cause. We really don't know the cause. And until you really know what the, the, the underlying uh, biological problem is, you can't really develop something that can actually fix it, you know, treat it and make it go away forever. So I just like to kind of just think about our, how our eyes move, and most of us don't think about how our eyes move at all. And I don't, I don't have a point, just so I'm just going to have to, you know, do this, or I'll use this one and then by accident switch the, switch the uh, slide by accident. So this is a famous picture by uh, Yarbis from 1967, where they they tracked how a person, a normal, right, normal person's eyes were moving, and they showed the person this image. And what you can see is that the eyes are always moving. Everyone's eyes are always moving. And you can see that there are points, particularly at the eyes, where there's a lot of black, because we tend to look at certain things preferentially in our visual world. And one of the things that we look at when we look at faces are eyes, although some people look at noses. It's kind of, kind of interesting. Um, but our eyes are constantly moving. We make a fixation point. That's when we perceive this, whatever it is we're looking at. And then we make a very fast movement to some new location, we call that a saccade, and during that fast movement, you don't perceive, right? So we don't see that blurriness, right? All we do is see the still image of the world because we're only seeing when our eyes are stopped and fixated, okay? But where eyes are moving all the time, okay? So, and why? Why do our eyes move all the time? Because you'd think that that wouldn't be such a good thing. And that's because there's a part of the eye called the fovea, and the goal of eye movements is to get vision, all of the, the visual world from both eyes to land on the fovea in the same position so that your visual world is, is the same, that you're getting the same image of the visual world. And so if you've never seen the back, the back of the eye through the ophthalmoscope, this is what it looks like, right, left eye. This is the optic nerve. So there's no neurons here. There's nothing there that's gonna receive light impulses or send it back to the brain. And the area of the finest vision, our most detailed vision, is this area called the fovea. It's the thinnest area. So that's, it's very important because we're going to talk about that later on in terms of what other people, I don't work in that particular area, but what other people have discovered about the fovea related to different types of nystagmus. So that's the goal of our eye movements. So I just like to just talk about how, you know, because I think we just don't think about eye movements very often. So when we read, we do the same thing. We fixate, and I, have, I made sure it was a Danish text so nobody really can read it. Well, maybe one person in Minnesota always can read it, but you know, so you pick, the circles are where the fixation point is. You make a saccade to another fixation point. And they were talking in the presentation earlier about, about speed reading or whatever, and what they do when they're teaching you to read faster is to take in more of, a, of, the, of the sentence at a time in your single fixation point, 
okay? That's called visual span. And so you can actually learn to increase your visual span. Any of us can. Um, I happen to be a fast reader. My one of my daughters is a slow reader. Doesn't matter, we both, you know, we remember what we read, but it's how often you stop that is, is, determines the speed of reading. And we all do this, right? Because, and we only again see the text at those t times when we have a fixation point. So uh, uh, there's a, a, a lab in in at University of Leicester run by Irene Gottlob, who does a lot of work in nystagmus. I see uh, Joe shaking his head. And so their group looked at how normal uh, individuals, controls, if we always call them, uh, read, and how somebody who, who has uh, infantile nystagmus syndrome reads. And you can see there's a lot of similarities in that, in that reading, right? But there's a lot of extra movements, right? So all that extra movement that's, that we see in the nystagmus individual right, is going to tends to slow reading speed, OK? So it, it's just nice to kind of know that. And you can learn how to you know, increase your reading speed, again, by, by learning how to take in more at every single fixation point. So how do we generate these eye movements? Um, I'm, I taught gross anatomy to, to medical students for many years, so you'll have to forgive the need to, you know, start at the beginning. So each of your eyes has six muscles attached to what we call these the extraocular muscles. And it's these muscles, these six muscles in each of your orbits, so that's 12 muscles, that are going to help uh, main, allow you to fixate on a, on a single point in the visual world. So if you think about it, there's a lot of coordination that has, there's a lot of muscles. There's a lot of coordination that has to happen to get those muscles to move the eyes at very fine amounts of degrees of the visual world so that you can have good vision. These 12 muscles, or I guess six muscles in each eye, are innervated by three different nerves that come from different parts of the brain, okay? These, and I have the names of them, but the names aren't that important, right? So, but they're three separate nerves. So now you have different parts of the brain just controlling the muscles, all right? And then those, the, the, the neurons that produce the electrical impulse to cause the muscles to contract, they, which are shown here in these, you know, blue circles and ovals, uh, they receive input from a lot of other parts of the brain. So we don't really even understand, from the neurosci general neuroscience perspective, exactly how this system is controlled in anyone, all right? And so now we have a case where I s I've spent a lot of my <coughs> research life studying strabismus. We don't understand what exactly is happening when things go awry, particularly in, in children where there's no other known problem associated with it. So they haven't had an injury, and they don't have a gene defect, and so on. So we have this very complicated system that controls eye movements. And so then, how are you going to think about, well, what causes nystagmus, right? It, that, it's, a, it's a big problem, because we don't even know how eye m movements are generated in very fine detail. So I will say that despite lots of labs having looked at it and many, many decades of study, we really don't understand what causes the in, these involuntary eye oscillations in what, we, what I'm going to call idiopathic infantile nystagmus or in nystagmus associated with albinism. Okay, there's a lot of associated things that we can, we can describe. There are injuries that you can have in your brain that can produce nystagmus. That's a very different thing um, than, well, and why during development does, does this nystagmus happen? And part of it, and I have to say this because all of us depend on money to do our research, and there actually are not a lot of people who do nystagmus research because it's actually hard to get money. So one thing that you guys can do <coughs> is remember to advocate you know, to organizations that do fund research that this is an important thing to fund. And we, those of us in the field, right, we, we write our grants and keep trying, and every once in a while we get one, yay, and then we do a whole bunch of studies. But the, fact, the funding is actually an important part, and I just have to say that. So, so now I'm, we're going to kind of step away from that kind of, this is how the eyes work, to kind of how I think about um, the research that I do and when I talk to my colleagues and those who I collaborate with. 
So as you know, I, uh, infantile nystagmus syndrome is a disorder of eye movement control, but it's often associated with other conditions. Achiasmus, so the, the normally the optic nerves that exit the eye that bring visual information to the brain cross. And so you can have, there are children who, where they don't cross, right? And that often produces nystagmus. Or it's associated with albinism. Um, the Gottlab lab identified the first gene that's specifically associated with nystagmus. It's called FRMD7, which is a great name. <laughs> Not. But it, contr it actually controls uh, a protein that is important for nerves to grow out during development. Okay. So all of these, that I, these examples, these three examples, and optic nerve hypoplasia, there's a whole lot of them relate to how nerves grow out during development, okay? So there's a theme here, right? There's a connect, connection between all of these associated conditions and nystagmus. That is, how the brain and the eye get connected during development and during childhood when they continue to mature. So we have the, we are, our working hypothesis, and the way I think about science is we come up with a hypothesis, and then we do everything to prove that we're wrong. And if we can't prove ourselves wrong, then, well, maybe it's true, right? Because you don't want somebody else to show that it's wrong. We, ha we try to show it ourselves. So uh, my working hypothesis is that one potential cause, right, of, of, of this nystagmus that we don't understand why, why it has shown up in our children um, is inadequate or abnormal innervational control of those muscles in the orbit, okay? And I'm going to try to convince you that, that with the data that we have that, well, could be, haven't dumped up my hypothesis down, down the tubes yet. So one way that we started thinking about this, because I've been working with strabismus so long, is that I uh, collaborate with a number of ophthalmologists, pediatric ophthalmologists, and they do a lot of, probably if, if you have children or yourselves have nystagmus, maybe you've had surgery, and so they take out a nice piece of extracular muscle to try to improve, usually, head posture. And it's actually a pretty big piece, and so we've been collecting these. And, and you, they're surgical waste, right? Normally they just get tossed away. But we, we use these because I think that looking at these muscles can give us a, essentially a window into how the brain is talking to them. Okay, because I think, I believe, and I would assume that it, most everybody who thinks about nystagmus thinks, right, this is instructions coming from the brain. So something is not growing right. Something is not, something is missing there. Well, what is it? Because there are many cases, I think, where we might be able to put it back in, right, and fix it. But that, that's me. I'm an optimist. Okay. So we started looking at these muscles, and so the first thing you do is these are muscles in cross-section. These are your eye muscles in cross-section, and each of these little rust-colored circles is a single muscle fiber. If you've never looked at extracted muscles, that's what they look like. And so it, they, they looked like they were somewhat different, but actually we measure them and we do a statistical analysis to show if they're different or not, because you know, otherwise you can't get anything published. And even though it looked like maybe there was a difference in fiber size, it wasn't sig statistically significant. You know, how many did we have? Maybe 10 muscles, right? So maybe if we had 50 muscles, we would, you know, you'd get a, big, a better picture, right? So it has to do with numbers of specimens and so on. Um, there's a lot of material that gets just tossed away that I think, man, if I could get that tissue, I would, could you know, do something with it. But what we did notice, I, I call it chance favors the prepared mind, that's how I think about science, is that, I don't know if you can see, I put giant arrows on a couple of these fibers. The, each of those single fibers have nuclei, right? And muscle, skeletal muscle, is multinucleated. And normally those nuclei sit on the very outside edge of those fibers, okay? And there's lots and lots of nuclei. But what I noticed is a lot of these fibers had nuclei in the center. This is not normal. This is a sign of usually denervation, reinnervation, or incomplete uh, where, where they're they're making connections and withdrawing and then making connections again, and I'm talking about these axons that grow down from the motor neurons that control muscle contraction. So that was my first, and there, there's a lot more of that, right? I mean, every muscle has a little bit of this, right? Because we damage muscle from doing exercise or whatever, but this is a fair bit, right? That's almost a third of the muscle fibers in these 10 specimens that we were looking at had this phenomenon in it. So I thought, well, that's interesting because we know it's associated with, with how the nerves connect to the muscles. 
And so here's just us counting. So we saw this in specimens where the, where the, where the, the person who had nystagmus just had nystagmus and no other known condition. We had muscles from, from subjects who had INS plus albinism and muscles from people who had INS plus optic nerve hypoplasia. And you can see this carried through all of those, okay? The, the muscles were showing the sign of what I would call denervation reinnervation or degeneration regeneration. So why? So we can also look at other things and we can do lots of this under the microscope. And so these are uh, black and white, so, but they're in longitudinal section instead. So each of these wavy lines is like a, is a single muscle fiber. That's what they look like in longitudinal section. And what you can see, and we can stain for, in this case I'm staining for the nerves themselves, and we can do that by hunting for something that's only found in, a protein that's found in nerves. And one of the things that we look at is something called neurofilament. And we can just turn it black. And I'm, you're going to show you, we can turn them all colors. Now we turn everything red and green and blue because it's much more fun. But I think you can see, I always say, you know, my second grader could, looked at this and go, well, I can see the difference. This doesn't have this stuff in it. And what you can see is there's a lot of nerve in these muscles from um, the control, extracular, human extracular muscles, and much less in these muscles from these individuals with nystagmus. So I called that hypo-innervated, then people objected to that term. Well, I don't care what you call it, there's less overall nerve fiber in there. So what, man and you can see we've, we've got the, this, because I, I have to count everything and do statistics. I mean, significantly less. Okay, well, that's interesting. So what about the connections between the nerve and the muscle? What do they look like? So this is a crazy experiment, and I'm surprised this person didn't quit my lab and run away and never do science again, but they did it, and we got it published, and so that's good. Yeah, um, she wanted to be an ophthalmologist, so you know, th that made her work really hard. So what we did is this is a single section through one of these muscle specimens. This is from a subject that had infantile nystagmus syndrome. This is a control. And each one of those red dots represent a connection between a single axon and a muscle fiber. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm a terrible person, right? <laughs> so, so, but, but I, I, you know, the, the, just the gestalt of it, clearly there are not as many connections. Well, there's not as much nerve, okay? And so there's not as many of these connections. These connections are called neuromuscular junctions. And there are conditions that we thought were really derived from brain problems, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, for example, or Lou Gehrig's disease, where there's increasing evidence that actually maybe the primary problem is at this level, at this neuromuscular junction level. So I never rule out anything because that's, you never, you'll never figure anything out if you, if you just eliminate things because it can't possibly be that way. But, it's, but it was interesting to, to us. And so we decided to follow up and we got, we've been collecting more and more muscles and it's really a lot of work for these uh, pediatric ophthalmologists to get us this muscle tissue. And so I really deeply appreciate them and I'll thank them all at the very end um, because we couldn't have done this without it. And so here what we're looking at, it looks very black, but there's actually lots of muscle fibers in there that you can't very, uh, see very well. And we turned those neuromuscular junctions green because they're pretty. And what you can see is this is control, okay? Each of these is that the connection between the end of that axon coming from those motor neurons that are kind of cause the muscle to contract and a single muscle fiber. And the one on, on your right are from a muscle of a, somebody who had infantile nystagmus syndrome and albinism. They're small. Okay, they're small. And we measured them because we do that. And they're significantly smaller. They're significantly smaller whether the, the muscles came from an individual who had infantile nystagmus syndrome or infantile nystagmus syndrome and albinism. Okay, so in addition to their being small, and I, w I took this out, but then I can't say the next thing without it, so I put it back in. <laughs> is we looked at these small neuromuscular junctions and asked the question, are they mature? Do they express the things that normal, mature neuromuscular junctions should express? And what happens is they express certain things during development, and then they go through a period where they change some of the proteins that are in these neuromuscular junctions to become the mature form from the immature form. And, well, and we can stain for these, and it's a little hard to see. So we, we looked for a part of these neuromuscular junctions called 
the gamma subunit, and that's not so important, except that that's the immature form. And what we see is that, one, not all infantile nystagmus syndrome is the same, because in those muscles from the children with infantile nystagmus syndrome and albinism, there were a lot of these, what we call immature neuromuscular junctions that didn't fully mature. And we know some things about the normal factors that control how these things mature normally. And so we can now go look, are some of those missing? We, can we put them back in? And we've been doing a lot of work where we can, because we can do sustained release of all kinds of proteins and growth factors in muscles that we do in our experimental animal models to manipulate these things. And can we drive these back to being mature? Right? Can we push them again to be normal, to get to normal size and to get to the normal protein configuration? So this is not my work. This, the one on, the, on your left is from the Gottlob lab in England. And the other is from a, a lab by a, a guy named uh, uh, Joe Carroll. And what they've been looking at, these are retina OCTs. And if you have a, if I've had one, right, almost all of us, eventually, now that they're the big thing, they can charge you a lot of money, right? <clears throat> but what it, it, it gives you a tremendous amount of information about your living retina. And what they've been able to demonstrate, so this is normal, and this is the fovea. So remember at the beginning, I said our goal of all of our eye movements is to get the visual world focused on your fovea. And normally, the fovea is very thin. Okay. And so what we see here in these subjects with albinism, and these are just varying other conditions, this is a whole series of subjects with albinism and the normal. There's normal variation in the th height of the fovea between, even between normals. But what you can see is in these individuals with albinism, and, it's a, which, and we know albinism is associated with INS, is that the, the fovea is what we call hyp it's hypodeveloped. And so their interpretation is that it is a delayed maturation of this structure in the retina, okay? Which is interesting, right? So we're talking about potential delayed formation of these connections between the motor neurons and the muscle fibers. And the same thing maybe is happening in the retina where we're getting a delayed development of the fovea. Right? And so sometimes this is associated with decreased visual acuity, sometimes it's not. But there are other, other structures within that retina that actually do correlate with visual acuity. And so they can learn a lot about your child's or your own infantile nystagmus by looking at your retina because, because they've got money. Um, some, I know they get a lot of money from the nystagmus network from, that's in England um, to do these studies in, in actual patients. And you know, they walk out because we can now do these beautiful analyses on the living eye. And so a number of labs, this is from a lab uh, uh, by the, an, a woman by the name of Eileen Birch. She does a lot of studies of developing ch uh, visual system in children. And so what, uh, what she did was look at um, visual acuity changes over time, and I, I heard that some, somebody say, maybe it was um, Evelyn talking about her own son, that they started out 2100 and now they're 2050, or that they've improved their visual acuity, and so this is what they did. And so each one of those little dots is visual acuity, and this is how old they are, okay? And this is how well they can see with this being 2020. Okay, essentially. And so what you can see is start out not very good visual acuity, but visual acuity is increasing over time. So this supports that kind of view that it's kind of a delayed maturation of the system. Delayed maturation of the motor system, delayed maturation of the visual system. But notice, right, in each of these cases, the vision is improving. This one, notice the vision doesn't improve in this because there's other problems associated with the retina that have nothing to do with the nystagmus, right? So in nystagmus or nystagmus with albinism, visual acuity is imp improves over time. That's a good thing, right? Because, but it also suggests that maybe we can manipulate this. Maybe we can increase the speed that these things happen. In the retina, it's a little bit harder, but at the muscle level, it's actually not harder. It's pretty easy because we do it for, for the other uh, conditions that we study. 
So what have I told you so far? I told you that if we look at the eye muscles from patients who have infantile nystagmus syndrome, they had decreased nerve and decreased neuromuscular den junction density. And that those connections between the axons, those motor axons and the muscle fibers were smaller and thinner and that they were less mature than they should be in, in a control child of the same age. So can we use what, we, what we've now gleaned from looking at these very precious samples and these very generous people who participated in these studies to try to think about how to develop some new way of thinking about how to treat it? Okay, and so that's kind of the goal. So, I'm, so we, you, you can't do these kinds of experiments on people. That would be unethical. So do, is there a decent animal model that we can use to try to answer these questions, to try to see if we can ferret out some way to push maybe this motor system to be more mature or to function in a way that we think might dampen the nystagmus, okay? So these, this is from a group in Switzerland, and they took mice, and so this is basically you're looking at kind of albinism related to nystagmus. So these guys are the little tiny, are little black mice, and they can put them in a, and I don't know if you've ever seen or had your child or you've had optokinetic nystagmus tests where they sit you on a chair and they run black and white bars around yeah. you. Yeah, and so your eyes do this. It's a reflex. You don't have to teach you. you you don't have to teach anybody to do this. It's actually a good thing because it keeps the world stable when you're walking around in the, in the universe. So the, this, uh, this is normal in these black mice, okay? And so this is a little bit less pigment, less pigment, no pigment, right? Zero pigment. And you can see that these mice have nystagmus. Right? They, so cool. So that means that we could potentially use these mice to see if we can treat if we can drive different aspects of how the muscles contract and function um, in these mice that have nystagmus. And, we, you can, and because it's a reflex, mice, you can't teach them how to look at things. So they're just gonna do their own little thing. They tend to jump off high places. I think they're not too smart, but you know, whatever. So, um, but we, we treat them very nicely, of course. So, so we can actually monitor their, their, how their eyes move. And so we wanted to make sure, well, we, do we see the same things in these mice that we, that we saw from these specimens that we were very lucky to get from the human the subjects with INS, and in fact, yes, their neuromuscular junctions are small and so on. So we think that they actually, in many respects, will make a good model for testing what we want to do. So, and here's just showing you, I have to show you, we can do this too. We don't have to go to Switzerland to do this. We can put our little mice in the little thing and then we rotate bars and their little eyes go like this. It's kind of cute. So, um, uh, mice, mice are funny. So, so here's, here's how I'm thinking about this, okay? So I've sh I already said this. We, we have decreased innervation and decreased neuromuscular junction density, which means that the brain can't control the muscle as well as it does in, in the, what, what I keep referring to as controls, right? As normal children, which results in that decreased gaze holding. So what if we can increase the maturity of the neuromuscular junctions? Or maybe we can actually change the muscle toward a different kind of muscle. And I didn't talk about, we've done a lot of research in that area and I didn't talk about it at all. But we actually have my, my, my muscle fibers that are fast, they really contract fast, and muscle fibers that are slow, which means that they tend to contract more slowly but have a, and have a more sustained contraction. Eye muscles are super fast. They're the fastest muscles in the human body. They, right, your eyes can move 900 degrees, uh, you know, in a second. But like, they, they are absolutely the fastest. Can we push some of these fibers to be slower? And if we make them slower and they have a slower contraction profile, would that dampen the nystagmus movements? And we can use our mice, right, because we can test how their eyes move by manipulating them. So, and why would this work? Okay, so we put it in the muscles, how, why would this work? And so I just have a, like a little cartoon on the side. So we have the muscles and we have the motor neurons in the brain and we can put these growth factors. We don't have to stick anything in a brain, right? Because who's gonna do that? No one, right? Is we can put these on the muscles, right? We can put them in a sustained release way um, or put injectables in of the, where they slowly released over time. But these things are known to be what we call retrogradely transported, right? They get carried by the axons of the nerves back to the brain. 
And we have a lot of evidence from other studies that we've done that this, we know this happens because this has been shown since, I don't know, the 70s. But we know that when we get it there, we can actually change the way those neurons work, right? Because these, what, what I call neurotrophic factors, are critical for how the muscles and nerves and motor neurons form in the first place. Which means that if we put them in the, muscle, in the orbit in the muscle, right, so we're not going into the brain or doing anything like that, but we can put these things in or on the muscle and change the brain and change the firing properties that are going to happen and change the way the contractions happen because they get carried back to the motor neurons and this is a normal, we're taking advantage of the normal biology here. And I should, so I'm going to hone in on one particular factor. So, uh, so this is my, my, my first ca candidate. This is what I'm going to try to do first in our little nystagmus mice. I'm going to use this neurotrophic factor called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And so we went back on the muscles of the human muscle specimens we had, and we looked to see, well, are there differences between brain-derived neurotrophic factor anyway? Because if there weren't, then adding more probably wasn't going to make a difference, right? This is the control in each of these f red circles. It's a little bright in here, so it's a little hard to see. In this case, we made them red, right, uh, with an antibody. So we, these are just looking at them under the microscope. When we looked at the muscles from the subjects with INS or INS and albinism, they really didn't have this brain-derived neurotrophic factor in them. And this was really startling to me. But it also said, man, if we can get it in there, which we can, this may be su sufficient to change certain characteristics, at least, of the nystagmus waveform or, you know, you, you can just dream up the next thing that we're, lo we're looking at. So we started to just use our animals to see, well, what happens if we give them ex this BDNF when they already have it, right? And so each of those blue circles is a, f is a single muscle fiber. In this case, we made them blue. We change the colors all the time. I keep us from getting bored. I don't know. So I don't know if you can see them in this one because there's so much light in this room. But there, this is what the normal looks like. This is after BDNF treatment. We can make them big. Well, big is, it would mean that that muscle is going to contract differently, particularly because these are big, slow fibers, right? And not only can we make them big, and I don't know if you can see that on the right, and these are all published. You can go tip, type my name into PubMed, which is the National Institutes of Health site, and pull up these papers if you just love reading about basic science. So not only did, did, did the BDNF make the fibers big, but they preferentially made the slow fibers big. And they preferentially made the connections between the nerve and the muscle, the, those neuromuscular junctions, big, right? And so we thought, wow. Right? This is really good potential neurotrophic factor to try to see if we can alter how the, the nystagmic, nystagmus waveform in our albino mice. So uh, the last thing we did before we do that, because it's for, these factors are very expensive, and to really make a difference, we think we need to treat for a number of mo months. So we need to have a slow release of this brain-derived neurotrophic factor over time to make a difference. And so, so these are just, this is a short-term experiment. And this is what one muscle contraction looks like. It's, you stimulate the muscle, it starts to contract, it reaches the peak force that it can, that particular muscle can re reach, and then it slowly, that force slowly dissipates over time. That's what it looks like. So with the red being control. In these muscles where we treated them with brain-derived neurotrophic factor, same speed of contraction, Eh, maybe it's bet stronger, maybe it's not. But look at how much longer it took for that muscle to relax, right? So I view that as something that's going to make the muscle, right? It's going to maintain that contraction, right? It's going to increase the contraction duration, right? Which, hypothetically at least, in, some th in, an, in our mice with nystagmus, right, should decrease the speed of all of those uncontrolled oscillatory movements. So that's our hypothesis. And this is where we are, because now we're trying to get money to do the next part, because that's the expensive part. So one of the, th so the first thing we're going to do, and we, we're pretty much ready to do what we just need, enough money to get all our brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is to see if we put this brain-derived neurotrophic factor into our m mice muscles in, the, in their little orbits, and then see if we can, over time, change their nystagmic 
eye movements, right? So that's the crux of the experiment, right? That's the proof, right? The other thing we're doing is because we can't do this for every factor that you could dream up because we've, we have lists of things where it could be this, it could be that, you know, there's so many potential molecules that could be involved. So we, uh, I, because I, I'm a lifelong learner, I did what we call a sabbatical last year and I went and learned how to do a technique called RNA-seq. And so I'm not a molecular biologist, so I went to learn new stuff, which is a good thing. It stretches your brain. It reminded me how hard it is to do something the first time because the first time I tried to get RNA out of cells, there wasn't any. So, and so when we're making proteins, right, we have DNA that's our genes. It gets turned into RNA, and that, or particularly what we call messenger RNA, and that RNA then gets turned into proteins. Okay, and so we can take, we can isolate all the RNA from whatever we want. So we isolated all the RNA from extraocular muscles of black, little black mice, extraocular muscles and the motor neurons also. And we isolated all that RNA <laughs> from, uh, from albino mice. And so we're in the middle of doing the comparison and what we hope we will find are uh, candidate molecules that, w that we hope will give us a clue as to what might be some of the primary differences. So we'll see, this is a lot of work um, and we're still in the throes of, I don't do bioinformatics as a whole field. If you, you young guy, people out there who are good in math, you know, you need to think about bioinformatics as a career. It's the future of science. Um, uh, and so hopefully we'll be able to pull something out. So maybe in two years or whatever, you know, we'll, we'll have some other candidate molecules that we're ready to test. So what I, I hope I convinced you today, uh, if, and I hope, hopefully nobody looks like they fell asleep, so that's good, is that the extraocular muscles, by looking at these muscle specimens that would normally be thrown in the waste can, that we can understand how the brain controls the eye position and eye movements, that there are differences between these muscles and their innervation between age, between subjects with infantile nystagmus syndrome and age match controls. And that w I r believe that we can modulate these immature neuromuscular junctions or this decreased motor innervation by adding in the things that might be missing with the first one that we're gonna test is this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So whether or not this turns out to be true, I guess we'll find out, so. Um, and I think that if you want to think about a different way to treat it, right, because there's lots of drug treatments that have been tested. They had that big study on gamma, gabapentin and um, memantine. And, but all of those things, when you treat systemically, are going to also have systemic side effects. That's the reality, right, for any condition that, that's treated systemically. And I had a daughter who um, was sick and who ha ended up being on, um, uh, immunosuppressants for quite a long time. Systemic drugs aren't the, are hard, right? But you do it because you have to do it, otherwise you, you know, it's bad. But if you can come up with something that might be local, that you can focus on what the problem is rather than affecting every muscle and every nerve in your entire body, at least from the, the theoretical point of view, would be preferable. So, and I kind of think about it um, because I have a son-in-law who is amblyopic and I have a, you know, I keep looking at my granddaughter and, you know, um, it's, you know, we all, we all have various things and what would I want? I kind of think, well, if my granddaughter needed this, what would I want her, would I be comfortable doing this with my granddaughter? That's kind of the way I think about things. So maybe that's just different than other scientists, but. You know, I w I'm not gonna come, try to come up with something that I wouldn't want my granddaughter to have. That's, I guess, what I'll say. So I think that this approach actually has a lot of potential, and so we'll see. Um, we were doing some stuff with strabismus, and actually I think that those studies are a little further along. Um, for some reason, NIH likes strabismus more than nystagmus. I don't know why. But I also just am gonna just end by thanking people, because needless to say, I didn't do all of this. Um, I had a wonderful, uh, uh, PhD graduate student Christy Willoughby there up at the top left um, uh, who uh, did a lot of the work uh, that I showed you today and a technician who's out of this world named Christopher Fitzpatrick and they did all this stuff and as well as countless other medical students and various other people and I just need to thank my various collaborators particularly Irene Gottlob here and Helena Lee 
who provided actually m the majority of those INS muscle specimens um, that I was able to look at. And the control specimens came from Dr. David Steger and Eusphelius, who are at uh, Texas. So, and, and of course, the people who helped support the work, a, a lot of which is local f and small foundations. Um, and that's just how it is. So I'm happy to answer any questions, and hopefully I didn't, uh, that was all clear. So anyway, thank you. Just very quickly, so the brain-derived neurotrophic factors that you're talking about trying to see the mm -hmm. do you envision that being a single therapy that it would resolve for the future, or would it be something that would have to be repeated? You know, that's a super interesting question. Just and one, uh, oh, so he asked, if, if you use brain-derived neurotrophic factor and it did work, would you have to then, after you did treat it for three months, would you then you have to treat it again for three months and again for three months? Super interesting question, right? Um, for strabismus, the way we think about strabismus is that if you can get the child aligned, the brain likes to keep the eyes aligned. And so the problem with a lot of the surgery, the muscle surgeries, is that they can't get the eyes aligned, right? In the strab in the strabismic, you know, particularly for children with 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 childhood onset strabismus. If they can get the child aligned and they can get binocularity, it often maintains. But just like my son-in-law who is amblyopic, his surgery, you know, out go the eyes, right? And so we've been doing work where we're looking at that and it looks like if we can move them enough, it might be maintained. Nystagmus is a different thing. If we get them mature, if we get enough nerve outgrowth, for example, and the muscle fibers grow, would that in fact be sustained? And we don't know. But I mean, it's a super good, it's a super good question because of course, you know, it would be like, so there are lots of treatments for a number of dis disorders. So for example, there's a lot of dystonias where you get forceful muscle contractions. So it's not like nystagmus, but like uh, torticollis and blepharospasm and things like that. And so they use botulinum toxin. And so though, but that is temporary, right? And we know that the effects disappear by about three months, and people get injected with botulinum toxin again and again and again and again. So our goal would be to come up with something where we could make enough changes that would then result in a stable system that would maintain itself. And whether or not that's a pie in the sky, you know, who knows. And it may be that we need more than one thing, right? It may be that, like I'm convinced for strabismus, for example, that we need to do whatever has caused that misalignment we're going to have to really provide probably more than just one factor for, for us to really get the eyes to be straightened. And so we've actually, we, we have treated strabismus monkeys <laughs> right? and actually improved their visual angle, so, which nobody thought we could do because they were adult monkeys. So the fact that we could do adults was like, okay, <laughs> like proof of concept. So, and it looks like I'm going to get my grant to keep doing that work, so we'll, we'll, we'll know in a number of years whether, we can, whether it does in fact get maintained because they're very expensive uh, studies. So I saw a hand up back there. I know, but honestly, you mentioned dystonia. It's not really about dystagmus. Mm -hmm. So if you know stuff about dystonia, my mom has it. Would you mind talking to me after the session? Sure. I'm happy Thanks. to. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for listening to us to our basic science, and I'm happy to talk about whatever I know about you know, afterwards. So thank you very much. On behalf of a and we just have a small token of oh, appreciation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any drawings for books. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like that book looked good. So I actually, um, there's a lot of good books. When I was on my local school board, too, I thought it was interesting that Evelyn, having had a sick kid, I think it really drives you to do things because you are your kid's best advocate and you should never be embarrassed or feel uncomfortable advocating for your own kids because actually there's a lot of kids whose parents can't do it and so you actually help you know having done it with my own child it, you help them also um, so it's you should never not do it right because you are their best advocate so power to the people <laughs> thank you